In the early 1920s, Southern football was seen as inferior, second-rate, junior varsity to the rest of the nation. The teams that made up the Southern Conference, the forerunner of the Southeastern Conference, the SEC, were treated with little respect because they hadn't beaten anyone of note outside their own region. That would all change when Alabama beat Washington 20-19 to in the 1926 Rose Bowl, a game that has been called the game that changed the South. The 1926 Rose Bowl and the impact it had on Southern football is the subject of this video. I'm John Johnston, and this is Hardcore College Football History. It was almost out of chance that Alabama got invited to the Rose Bowl in 1926, as the Rose Bowl committee didn't consider them or at least they weren't their first choice by a very long shot, I found several references to teams that were invited, and Alabama was pretty far down the list. The list included Colgate, Michigan, Princeton, along with Tulane and Dartmouth. Tulane at the time was coached by Clark Shaughnessy, the father of the T-formation, who had become a very well-known coach later in his career. They rejected the invitation as their team had already disbanded for the season. Dartmouth was invited, but a snowstorm and concern about how long it would take to get to the West Coast kept them from accepting the offer. Illinois was considered, even though they'd lost to Nebraska, Iowa, and Michigan, because everyone on the West Coast wanted to see some guy named Red Grange play in person. Alabama gets noticed and gets an invite because the Rose Bowl committee chairman had received a telegram from Alabama Governor William W. Brandom stating that, If you are interested in a real opponent for your West Coast football game, then give Alabama serious consideration. So in the end, Alabama gets and accepts the invitation, but the Crimson Tide are expected to be trounced by Pacific Coast Conference champion Washington. Washington was undefeated at the time with a record of 10-0-1, tying with Nebraska. The Purple Tornado, as they were sometimes called then, had scored 461 points to the opposition's 39 and had shut out six of their opponents. Washington was coached by Enoch Bagshaw, who was in his fifth season. They were led by halfback George Wildcat Wilson, who was considered by many the best player in the nation. From Talk of the Tide, a book about the history of Alabama football, Hoyt Wu Winslet says, On the way out to the Rose Bowl, we get off the train a time or two to limber up our legs and run around a little. We are all scared to death going out to California, a bunch of Alabama boys who'd never been far from home. We had heard how great Washington was and how they were going to romp on us. They were big and they had the best player I ever played against, George Wilson. It was the consensus that Wilson was the best player in the country and he was the guy we had to stop. Washington's captain was fullback Elmer Tesro, a guy so tough he played through the 1923 Rose Bowl with what he thought was a bad knee but turned out to be a leg broken in three places. That game ended in a 14-14 tie with Navy. Now Alabama isn't without their own accolades. A member of the Southern Conference, they were 9-0, only giving up seven points the entire season. Their opponents included Georgia Tech, Mississippi A&M, later Mississippi State, along with future SEC opponents, LSU, Kentucky, Florida, and Georgia. Still, there are those who believe that Alabama is going to get blasted. Will Rogers, who was a widely known humorist and celebrity at the time, the same man who said, I never met a man I didn't like, called Alabama the Tusca Losers. One sports writer predicted a 51-0 Washington win. And in the first half, Washington proves the critics to be correct as they take a 12-0 lead. The Bama boys are a little overwhelmed by the environment, it appears. Alabama running back Johnny Mac Brown says his quarterback, Pooley Hubert, got everyone to settle down and play football. Again, from the talk of the tide. 
Hubert made most of the tackles in the first few minutes. I can see old Pooley, who was several years older than the rest of us guys on the team, as he made a tackle to save a touchdown and jumped up. His helmet was twisted around. He readjusted it and turned to the ref and said, Time out, Mr. Ref. The other ten of us were squatting there looking up at the big crowd and not knowing exactly what to do, and we saw Pooley walking toward us with a very business-like look on his face. He walked up to us and put his hands on his hips and said, Now just what the hell's going on around here? That somehow resurrected the Alabama team, and we got together and managed to play pretty well. You'll note I'm not going to try to do any of this with a southern accent because it would be terrible and probably really insulting. As one version of the story goes, that at halftime third-year coach Wallace Wade walked into the locker room, looked at his battered players, and uttered one simple line. And they told me that boys from the South would fight. That was all he said, and that was all he needed to say. Another version states, At halftime, the Alabama team sprawled on crimson blankets spread at one end of the field. Wade, moving among his players, made two tactical changes. He ordered Hubert to run with the ball more often, and he shifted guards Ben Enos and Bruce Jones to end on defense. We need more strength outside, said Wade, to keep Wilson from going wide. Washington's Wilson had gone out with an injury late in the second quarter. This sets the stage for Alabama to go on a scoring explosion. In less than seven minutes, the Crimson Tide scored three touchdowns, Two by Johnny Mac Brown on receptions of 61 and 30 yards, giving the Tide a 20 to 12 lead. Now Johnny Mac Brown would go on after football to become an enormous Hollywood star, making over 160 movies and appearing in television shows. He becomes well known for his westerns, and it's obvious by looking at him. I mean, look at the man's face. He has the smile of a Hollywood star and the face of a Hollywood star. And his life is a story for another day. Anyhow, Wilson comes back into the game and throws a 27-yard touchdown pass to George Gutterson, bringing the score to 20-19. to Gutterson had missed an extra point drop kick in the first half, and there is no such thing as a two-point conversion. So Alabama wins the game 20-19. to How important was Washington's Wilson? Washington's Wilson finished the game with 134 yards and 15 carries, five completions for 77 yards and two touchdowns. He accounted for 211 of Washington's 317 total yards, and Alabama was unable to reach the end zone while he was on the field. While he was on the sideline, Washington could only manage 17 yards, and the Crimson Tide scored three unanswered touchdowns. Now, the fallout from this game is enormous because Alabama isn't just seen as Alabama. They're seen as a symbol to the entire South. They take the train back to Tuscaloosa and they are greeted by huge throngs of people no matter where they stop. In New Orleans, nearly 1,000 Tulane students held a rally at the train station. When they get home, everyone comes out to celebrate the Great Tide victory. An editorial from the Birmingham Post-Herald on January 2, 1926, contains the lines. While Alabama takes special pride in the fact that the team that conquered the Pacific Coast champions was from the University of this state, nevertheless, in a broader sense, it was an impressive victory for the whole South. And in future, will give football teams of the southern states a higher rating than they have hitherto enjoyed. And then later on, This victory will bring a better understanding of Southern athletics and will do much also to wipe out many wrong impressions that persist concerning this whole section of the country. It was a victory for the virile young manhood of the South, a victory for the fine quality of courage inherent in the citizenship of this region and is bound to establish closer bounds on sympathy between the South and the West. Then it finishes, the last line is, Alabama is proud of the Tuscaloosa team and will warmly welcome it in its return to the South. From the book Alabama in the 20th Century by historian Wayne Flint, we get, 
The Tides Rose Bowl victory in the national championships that followed in 1926, 1930, 1934, and 1941 proved a decisive rebuttal to the negative Northern publicity that depicted Southerners as overly pious Bible belters, hookworm sapped weaklings, lazy slaggards, or incest prone defectives. Come out on the football field, the heroes and crimson seem to be saying and we'll kick your butts. Alabama goes on the next season to play in the Rose Bowl again, the game ending in a 7-7 tie with Stanford and with the Crimson Tide claiming another national title. Alabama would win several more Rose Bowls before 1946. The Rose Bowl Conference tie-in with the Big Ten and Pacific Coast Conference and the Pac-8, Pac-10, and Pac-12 began in 1947. To this day, Alabama fight song, Yeah, Alabama, commemorates the team's historic Rose Bowl game appearance featuring the lyrics, Remember the Rose Bowl, will win then. The 1926 Rose Bowl win by Alabama changed the perception of Southern football. Teams like Yale, Harvard, Michigan, Minnesota, or Washington couldn't assume that the South couldn't compete at the same level. Now, it took decades before Southern dominance appeared, and that probably happened when Paul Bear Bryant took over at Alabama in 1958. But that's another story for another day, another story to investigate. There are many more college football stories to tell, and I plan on doing so in this channel. I hope you like them, and I hope you subscribe and stay tuned for more. And if you have any ideas on stories you'd like me to cover, please leave them in the comments. And please share these videos with their friends who might be interested in either history or college football so that this channel can grow. I'm John Johnston with Hardcore College Football History. Thank you.